Let's do that real quick. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and so then we've talked about stress. We've defined the specific event of a crisis. And then what is resilience? Resilience is our strength and ability to respond successfully to stress or crisis. And there are a lot of factors associated with family resiliency. And we're going to talk about some of these. Those include reframing. That's this cognitive process that we've kind of touched on all along. Um, working together with other people in the family in a partnership and then being flexible and adaptive to the changes that have to occur um, as a result of stress or crisis. This family stress coping model can kind of help you understand for those of you who are more visual, um, what it kind of looks like and, and what's involved in family resiliency, right? So when you look over here at A, that's your stressor or your crisis. And then all of these interrelated, um, B and C and A are all kind of interrelated. Um, there, it's not you know, a linear process, right? So you have these coping mechanisms, um, resources outside the family that you might connect with for support. And then C is that idea of reframing. So it's the family's kind of cognitive appraisal of the situation, their perception of what has happened. Um, you know, we're, we're going to watch a video before we leave class um, from a, a mother who lost a child or children, I can't remember. Um, that's a significant crisis in the family, right? Um, but she talks about her having to sort of reframe that cognitively to think not just about, you know, um, the impact that that loss has, but the fact that she has other children that still need a mother um, and that type of thing. And, you know, this, this idea that um, some people take the approach like everything happens for a reason. Um, this mother presents it more as like shit happens to everyone. And, you know, I am not unique in the fact that I've experienced loss or crisis and that both of those are examples of cognitive reframing or perception of the event, right? You have to um, kind of think it through and process it. And of course, that doesn't happen in the moment that that occurs through the process of grief and stress. Um, but what I really want you to note in this model is that A, B and C are all kind of interconnected. They go back and forth in this kind of cyclical manner. And then they result over time in that triangle that's outside the model, families adaptation. So eventually families, because of their ability to appraise and perceive the situation differently and the coping and resources that they connect with, they're able to adapt to the changes that occur. Um, generally speaking, our job as individuals, you know, moving into um, the world and possibly working with families, um, unless we're a professional working in like a mental health realm, we will likely be providing support to families as friend or family member ourselves. And then it's important to kind of know um, related to B, you know, what are the resources in your community, um, the mental wellness resources, what agencies can support families, um, that type of thing can be important to know um, in terms of thinking about how we promote stress management with families. <clears throat> um, so some more specific stress management strategies outlined here. I I've spoken to this idea of positive perspective or reframing. Um, new behaviors. So following through with behavior you have to do something in order to minimize or counter the stress. Um, and so, you know, recognizing I'm under stress, I, I have this thing going on um, and I have to respond to it in kind. That's kind of the first step. And then actually following through with what are the ways that I'm going to respond to this um, is a really important piece of stress management. The idea of dyadic coping, this refers to partners in a relationship working together to support one another during stressful life events. That's not always the case um, or the tendency, right? Um, think about that mother who lost a child. 
oftentimes what we see in couple relationships when something so significant like that happens is partners isolating from one another, um, partners, you know, um, like not talking about the issue, not being emotionally open with one another, um, and really the coming together and working together as partners is um, super important to helping kind of navigate situations like that. Daily exercise. Um, I don't know if you guys have tapped into this yet. Um, I tried when I was in college and I was not always successful at it, but um, the CDC recommends daily exercise for people ages six and up, at least 30 minutes a day, light to moderate physical activity. Um, this has obvious physical benefits, but it also has very important cognitive and emotional benefits that we don't always think of. Um, and I would say that adults in our society, so it, it was difficult for me in college, and then it became even more difficult when I, you know, went out into the working world and took kind of a sedentary job sitting at a desk majority of the day. Um, we do not walk many places once we get outside of college, and so we have to be very um, intentional in kind of carving out this time into our day, but 30 minutes a day of um, light to moderate exercise is the recommendation. Social media, we see this thread coming in again here in terms of how we manage our stress, um, but limited social media exposure is related to positive psychological outcomes. The more social media you consume, um, the, the lower your mental health and wellness you know, they have a um, correlational relationship. Religion and spirituality. So there's a distinction here, right? Some people prescribe or subscribe to um, very specific religious doctrine, um, while others, you know, take more of um, a spiritual approach to things without necessarily the confines of religion. Um, but either and both of these are linked to positive coping mechanisms and stress responses, right? So religion and spirituality are very important in terms of thinking about our health and wellness. Um, the, the takeaway message here is that what you believe is not as important as the fact that you, that you believe something, right? That we are all kind of um, connected to something outside of ourselves. Um, and then finally, lightheartedness, proper sleep hygiene, making sure that you're getting enough sleep, um, some sort of consistent, um, you know, nighttime routine, and having pets. All of these have been linked to positive outcomes for people and are related to resiliency and coping. <clears throat> so this is kind of um, the list of most significant family crisis examples that we would think of um, family members experiencing some sort of physical or mental illness, midlife crisis, that is a thing. Um, it happens to people and can result in, you know, um, physical changes, mental, emotional changes. Um, sometimes like financial crisis is born out of midlife crisis. It can have impacts on um, the partner in a number of ways. Uh, poverty and unemployment, substance use and abuse, loss of a family member, as we've already mentioned, and then infidelity. Infidelity is one that I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about um, because I think the other ones are, you know, pretty straightforward, but this idea of infidelity has um, some important kind of pieces to understand. Um, there can be various types of infidelity, right? So not just having a physical relationship with another partner outside of a monogamous relationship, um, but also emotional connection with someone, um, online connection, you know, that becomes emotional. There's all different types of infidelity outlined um, in the textbook. There are a lot of different reasons that people would engage in infidelity in the relationship. One of the most important reasons um, is called the Coolidge effect. And so Coolidge effect is the term that is used to describe the waning or the, um, the going down of sexual excitement and then the effect of novelty and variety on sexual arousal. So if you think back to our previous discussions about sex and relationships, we talked about how after like a couple is married, there's this 
steady increase in sex behavior over the first year of marriage. And then there's a sharp decline after that point, right? Um, and that sharp decline in sexual activity could be related to this Coolidge effect where, you know, the kind of excitement of the novelty of it has worn off. And that might be where we see people at some point in the relationship seeking, you know, excitement, novelty, um, variety outside of the confines of marriage. So understand what the Coolidge effect is and how that might show up in a relationship. And then there are lots of um, specifics to recovery from infidelity in the relationship. Again, these are outlined in the text, um, but it's important to know, you know, this is not um, an end all be all in a relationship. Again, if both partners can come together um, in a way that, you know, is supportive of one another and kind of helps work through the stress brought out by this experience in a relationship. Any thoughts or ideas on any of this so far? Okay. Um, I wanted to share this quote from the text about the idea of marriage and family therapy. It says, if you don't have time to work on your marriage, then you will need to take time to work through your divorce. I mean, I think that's pretty telling in thinking about, um, you know, marriage itself is a, a partnership that hopefully people enter into with the full understanding that it's going to be work. Um, you know, both, both partners have to kind of come to the table willing to work on themselves first and foremost, and then to be open and communicate um, about how that work on ourselves as an individual kind of shows up and, and is reflected in our marriage and partnerships. Um, there are lots of different types of marriage and family therapy, especially now with like the virtual world being more open. Um, there's lots of teletherapy options. I think um, from my perspective, it will be beneficial, would be beneficial to do some individual and then partner therapy. So most um, marriage and family therapists will do some sort of individual work and then, you know, work with a couple in tandem. Um, but that tends to kind of get at that piece of, you know, working on yourself and then also working um, on the relationship. Um, I think the effectiveness of marriage and family therapy depends a whole lot on, you know, the partners and how they kind of um, show up to do that work. Um, but one thing that can be very effective is, and there's an example of it in the text on page 315, um, is this idea of a behavioral contract, right? Um, and so the, the text has this example, behavior behaviors that each partner agree to engage in and days of the week. And so they basically create like a check sheet um, for the partners to sort of utilize in the home. Um, but some examples on, on the one that they wrote here are no negative statements to the partner, compliment the partner twice each day, hug or hold partner once a day, and then go out to dinner with each other Saturday nights. Um, and so each partner, you know, would check off how many times they do this. It seems very contrived um, and sort of artificial, but if you have gotten to the point in your relationship where you're not doing any of these things, that tends to have this kind of snowball effect, right, where the longer you go without physical contact or positive um, affirmation and communication with one another, then the further that goes um, and it just becomes harder and harder to kind of reconnect and re-engage in that way. So something like this can put some parameters on it. And again, it may feel artificial initially, um, but could have you know, implications for making positive changes to behavior over time. Um, I am, oops. Sorry, I'm looking for a link. Um, and I think, so for just the next few minutes, we're gonna watch um, a quick video. Again, this is looking specifically at one woman's experience with this idea of resiliency. 
um, and her talking about kind of the three key factors um, that helped her manage a crisis in her life, right? Um, let me get the video going and then we'll come back and just kind of debrief on that for a few minutes and then that will take us to our time. Three strategies that underpin all of my work and they're pretty readily available to us all. Anyone can learn them. You can learn them right here today. So number one. Are you guys seeing the video? Let's just do this. Good. Resilient people get that shit happens. They know that suffering is part of life. This doesn't mean they actually welcome it in. They're not actually delusional. Just that when the tough times come, they seem to know that suffering is part of every human existence. And knowing this stops you from feeling discriminated against when the tough times come. Never once did I find myself thinking, why me? In fact, I remember thinking, why not me? Terrible things happen to you just like they do everybody else. That's your life now, time to sink or swim. The real tragedy is that not enough of us seem to know this any longer. We seem to live in an age where we're entitled to a perfect life, where shiny, happy photos on Instagram are the norm, when actually, as you all demonstrated at the start of my talk, the very opposite is true. Number two, resilient people are really good at choosing carefully where they select their attention. They have a habit of realistically appraising situations and typically managing to focus on the things that they can change and somehow accept the things that they can't. This is a vital, learnable skill for resilience. As humans, we are really good at noticing threats and weaknesses. We are hardwired for that negative. We're really, really good at noticing them. Negative emotions stick to us like Velcro, whereas positive emotions and experiences seem to bounce off like Teflon. Being wired in this way is actually really good for us and served us well from an evolutionary perspective. So imagine for a moment, I'm a cave woman and I'm coming out of my cave in the morning. And there's a saber tooth tiger on one side and a beautiful rainbow on the other. It kind of pays for my survival for me to notice this tiger. The problem is we now live in an era where we are constantly bombarded by threats all day long. And our poor brains treat every single one of those threats as though they were a tiger. Our threat focus, our stress response is permanently dialed up. Resilient people don't diminish the negative, but they also have worked out a way of tuning into the good. One day when doubts were threatening to overwhelm me, I distinctly remember thinking, no, you do not get to get swallowed up by this. You have to survive. You've got so much to live for. Choose life, not death. Don't lose what you have to what you have lost. In psychology, we call this benefit finding. In my brave new world, it involved trying to find things to be grateful for. At least our wee girl hadn't died of some terrible, long, drawn out illness. She died suddenly, instantly, sparing us and her that pain. We had a huge amount of social support from family and friends to help us through. And most of all, we still had two beautiful boys to live for who needed us now and deserved to have as normal a life as we could possibly give them. Being able to switch the focus of your attention to also include the good 
has been shown by science to be a really powerful strategy. So in 2005, Marty Seligman and colleagues conducted an experiment and they asked people, all they asked people to do was think of three good things that had happened to them each day. What they found over the six months course of this study was that those people showed higher levels of gratitude, higher levels of happiness and less depression over the course of the six month study. When you're going through grief, you might need a reminder or you might need permission to feel grateful. In our kitchen, we've got a bright pink neon poster that reminds us to accept the good. In the American army, they framed it a little bit differently. They talked to the army about hunting the good stuff. Find the language that works for you, but whatever you do, make an intentional, deliberate, ongoing effort to tune into what's good in your world. Number three, resilient people ask themselves, is what I'm doing helping or harming me? This is a question that's used a lot in good therapy. And boy, is it powerful. This was my go-to question in the days after the girls died. I would ask it again and again. Should I go to the trial and see the driver? Would that help me or would it harm me? Well, that was a no-brainer for me. I chose to stay away. But Trevor, my husband, decided to meet with the driver at a later time. Late at night, I'd find myself sometimes poring over old photos of Abby, getting more and more upset. I'd ask myself, really? Is this helping you or is it harming you? Put away the photos, go to bed for the night, be kind to yourself. This question can be applied to so many different contexts. Is the way I'm thinking and acting helping or harming you in your to get that promotion, to pass that exam, to recover from a heart attack, so many different ways. I write a lot about resilience and over the years this one strategy has prompted more positive feedback than any other. I get scores of letters and emails and things from all over the place of people saying what a huge impact it's had on their lives. Whether it is forgiving family, ancient transgressions, arguments from Christmas's past, or whether it is just trawling through social media, whether it is asking yourself whether you really need that extra glass of wine, asking yourself whether what you're doing, the way you're thinking, the way you're acting is helping or harming you, puts you back in the driver's seat. It gives you some control over your decision making. Three strategies, pretty simple, They're readily available to us all. All right, so if you will take a minute and type into the chat kind of one thing, I guess, that stands out to you from what she just shared, um, maybe the most impactful piece of her strategies or her thought process that was shared. Um, And then after you've done that, um, you can type your name into the chat as a record of attendance while we're doing chat. And I'm thinking about it, um, the helpful or harmful question. Um, somebody said, letting yourself feel the good. And she spoke to how, you know, she had to kind of give herself permission during the grief process. I mean, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, finding the good or that idea of accepting the good that does not necessarily come natural while we are in the middle of stress and crisis, right? So you kind of have to um, be intentional and, and cognitively um, purposeful in doing that work. Um, the example of the husband wanting to see the driver and her not wanting to go to the trial shows how people cope differently, right? And so Again, that brings us to that idea of partnership um, and how important it would be to be open about how you're feeling, communicating with your partner, um, because as you know, Melanie pointed out, um, we don't all need and want the same things in terms of our resiliency and, and coping strategies. Um, 
I think the idea of holding yourself accountable for the helpful and harmful, and that goes back to what we talked about with following through with behaviors, right? So it's one thing to acknowledge this is not helping me. It's another thing to stop engaging in that behavior. Um, the, the awareness of it is the first step. And then that follow through with action and accountability is, you know, an important second step. Um, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, that piece that she talked about in terms of how we are hardwired to recognize threat and negativity rather than the opposite of that. Right. And so if we know that, then we can be more intentional in thinking about, looking for the good and finding the positive, but knowing that that isn't a, a practice that comes naturally. It's kind of like um, a lot of times folks with major depressive issues or anxiety have to go through what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, and they learn how to unthink um, negative thoughts that are impacting behaviors in a negative way. Um, this is really similar to that, that idea of benefits finding or um, looking for gratitude. Um, you know, that's a, it's a practice and she, she referred to it as a learnable skill, right? So we might have to engage in some intentional um, work to get there. Um, DJ pointed out that that type of gratitude or benefits finding will have significant impact on your outlook over time, um, generally speaking, your life outlook. And people who do that are happier and less depressed, right? So um, that's a, a good skill to have. And there's tons of resources now, you know, you can buy planners that have like gratitude journals, gratitude logs. Um, but I do think that habit of just kind of noticing when something good has happened um, can be really important for your life in general. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of next week, uh, we will be talking about families in later life, kind of bringing us to the end of our course together. Um, again, there will not be any asynchronous content, but before we meet next week, I will get a final exam review guide posted for you. It will just give you kind of a, an overview of the major concepts, and your final exam is going to be posted online, and it will be a written final, um, so you will need to carve out some time to do that writing. Um, I will give you a variety of questions that you can choose from, and they will be cumulative in nature. So, so drawing on, you know, all aspects of the course. Um, but again, I'm not going to give you too many specific parameters. I just want to know that you're thoughtful and thorough um, in terms of how you describe um, these different issues and concepts. Um, and then that will be that will be it for us. So I will I'll make sure also the um, the six written reflections. I'm not sure if it was in this class or the other section that um, we talked about the due date for those, but those are due on reading day, which is April 28th. So coming up in a couple of weeks also. Um, so big things to be working on are reflection six through 10 and then getting prepared for um, the final. Any questions or concerns? All right. Thank you for your time. That's all I've got. And I will see you all next week. Um, I actually have a question. 